Hi, welcome to Sunday morning Bible class at Shepherd of the Hills, doing it a little bit different now. Um, good to spend time in God's word with you. We're in the gospel of John. Today we start John chapter 10. So let's pray and get going. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of your word and for the assurance that it always accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. We praise you, Father, for the beauty of this spring season, for the glory of wildflowers in Texas. Thank you, God, for the way you are at work in our world and in our individual lives. And now we pray the gift of your Holy Spirit in rich measure. Teach us what you would have us know. Help us to believe what you teach us and to live what we believe. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. Okay, if someone were to ask you what you thought was the single most familiar passage in all of Scripture, what do you think your answer might be? Maybe you would think about it for a minute. Certainly one would expect John 3.16 to be in there, right? That's a very familiar passage. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. A lot of people know that verse. In fact, a few years ago, the words John and the numbers 316 used to be on sheets behind goalposts at professional football games. Another familiar verse in the Bible might be the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A lot of people know that verse also. I think a really good argument could be made that there is one verse in the whole Bible that is more familiar to all people all over the world than any other. And if it were my choice, it would be the first verse of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I think more people know those words than any of the other words in the Bible. It's almost impossible to go to a Christian funeral and not at least read those words, probably hear them read as one of the scriptures, but at the very least, you'll find those words printed on the back of the little cards that funeral homes give out on which they put information about the deceased person. Those words are very familiar and the effectiveness of that analogy is truly amazing, I think, because most of us have never seen a real sheep. We've seen maybe photographs of sheep, but we've never seen a real sheep. Certainly we've never been close to a real sheep close enough to touch one, and yet the analogy works so well. We know about sheep only from photos, and that's monumentally different from the way it was back when the words of Psalm 23 were first written. Psalm 23 is so comforting because it assures us that God takes care of us always. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is always there side by side with us. God takes care of us all the time. The Lord is my shepherd. Sheep have been a part of the life of the ancient people for a very long time. The very first time that we read about sheep in the Bible is way back in Genesis 4, the fourth chapter of the Bible, where we have the story of Cain and Abel. We're told in that chapter that Abel was a keeper of of sheep. Sheep had been domesticated for a very long time. Sheep were the chief currency measuring individual wealth. People's lives depended on sheep because they provided food to eat, milk to drink, wool to make clothes, and covering for tents with their hides. People exchange sheep like money. I can't imagine walking up to somebody and saying, what do you want for that? I'll take two sheep for it. But that's the way it was. Most importantly, sheep played a central role in the worship life of ancient people. Sheep were offerings. They were sacrifices. They were burnt offerings, sin offerings, guilt offerings, and peace offerings. Sometimes the sheep were kept alive. Sometimes the sheep were sacrificed. The Bible describes sheep as affectionate, docile, relatively defenseless, and in constant need of care and protection. 
Years ago, the sheep industry was pretty big business in Texas. It's gone away now because the value of wool has gone down so terribly. But in Texas, back a few years ago, when there were a lot of sheep ranchers, there was a bumper sticker that was popular, and you found it on the, on the back bumper of a lot of pickup trucks in sheep country. The bumper sticker read, eat more lamb, 50,000 coyotes can't be wrong. Sheep are relatively defenseless. The Bible talks about the people of God as sheep, and so it describes God as shepherd, but not only God, it also talks about the people that God appoints to take care of his sheep as shepherds. The relationship is a very close and personal relationship. But one of the sad things that the Bible tells us is that many of the people that God appointed to be shepherds, people like prophets, were wicked. Instead of taking care of the sheep the way God wants sheep to be taken care of, the wicked shepherds didn't care about the sheep at all. They only cared about themselves. And because of those wicked shepherds, God promised that one day he was going to send one shepherd who was going to be the best shepherd ever. One good shepherd. Isaiah makes that promise. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. Isaiah writes these words. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. If you look closely at those words, the image that creates for Jesus is so very personal. He gently leads those that have young. One of the most popular images we have of Jesus is the way he welcomed children one time. In John chapter 10, Jesus picks up on this imagery and identifies himself as the good shepherd. But in this chapter, Jesus adds something to the image that is found nowhere else. And we're gonna to come to that in a little while. But let's get back to the text, John 10. Look at John 10, the first six verses. Jesus is speaking and Jesus says, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter by the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from a stranger because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Last week, we talked about the end of John 9. In John 9, we have the dramatic account of the healing of a man who had been born blind. And we talked a little bit last week about why in that miracle, Jesus spit on the ground and made some mud to put on the blind man's eyes. Somebody that watched on line suggested the possibility that it was a connection to the creation Way back at the beginning in Genesis, we're told that God created people out of the dust of the earth. And a person watching online suggested that when Jesus made mud out of dust to heal the man's eyes, it was a connection to the creation. He was basically saying, we're starting all over again. It's a great idea. It appears that there was no break at all in that moment when Jesus healed the blind man and all of the controversy that came with that and the continued teaching of Jesus, the Savior didn't take a break. He just kept right on teaching. If you remember, the blind man who was healed believed in Jesus and worshiped him, but the enemies of Jesus continued to reject him. It would be easy to argue that John 10 is part of the Savior's persistent 
and unyielding efforts to persuade all those people that rejected him to persuade the whole world to believe in him. Jesus begins by declaring, I tell you the truth. And we've talked before about how truth plays such a central role in the Gospel of John and what truth means in the Bible. The Greek words translated, I tell you the truth, are much simpler. Jesus said, Amen, Amen. He used the very same word that we use to end our prayers. The word amen is Jewish in origin. Jesus was a Jew, the disciples were Jewish, the first believers were Jewish. And Jewish words, along with a whole bunch of other elements of Jewish culture, were adopted by the Christian church. We took over their scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, including the word amen. The word amen sounds pretty much the same in Hebrew, in Greek, in English, in pretty much every language. Christians all over the world use the word amen. Amen is a declaration of agreement, affirmation, confirmation, assertion, approval, and endorsement. It means yes, absolutely, positively, no doubt about it, count on it. While Jesus would never have said this, Saying amen is the same as when people in our culture sometimes say, I swear it's true. The Bible says we're not supposed to swear that way. But sometimes people do it to emphasize their conviction in something. It's like saying, I promise this is absolutely true. And there is no way in the world that it isn't true. Jesus used the word amen often. He used the word amen in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Jesus said, Amen, Amen. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Amen, amen, I tell you the truth. Jesus used the word a number of times. Different Bible translations for this verse, for the words amen, amen, are things like verily, verily, most assuredly, truly, truly, I tell you the truth, I assure you, I like this one best, I can guarantee that this is true. Jesus regularly prefaced his words with the words amen, amen, to remind us, to emphasize the fact that everything he said was true and we can count always that he's gonna be telling us the truth. Tragically in John 10, at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus uses the words to tell us about a very painful truth, a truth that with all our heart, we wish was not true. Jesus said, amen, amen. There are people who sneak into the sheep pen, people who do not enter by the gate the way honest people do, people who sneak in because they are thieves and robbers. The Greek word for thief is kleptes, which is where the word kleptomaniac in our language come from. A kleptomaniac is someone who has a disease, someone who steals, not because they enjoy doing it, but because they can't help it, because they have a psychological need. That's not the kind of thief that Jesus was talking about. He's talking about people who steal because they like stealing, because they think stealing is fun, because they don't care that they're hurting someone by their stealing. People who aren't bothered at all about the harm that they do. The Greek word for robber is lestes, and it means plunderer, bandit, outlaw, pirate, one who pillages. Jesus said, 
there are people like that in the church. Not even in the church are we free from those who want to harm us. There are predators in the church. We wish it weren't true, but it is. Go back to Matthew, this time Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Jesus talks about the predators in the church. Matthew 7, verse 15. The words of Jesus. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Look at another passage, this one from Acts chapter 20, verse 28. St. Paul expresses his concern for the Christians in Ephesus because of his fear of what might happen to them because of the predators in the church. Acts 20, verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, people will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. St. Paul is warning the Christians in Ephesus to be careful because there are gonna be people that are gonna to try to hurt them, try to hurt their faith. And he says, not only is it gonna happen from the outside, but it's even gonna happen from the inside. And you can't help but wonder why in the world this is so. One would hope that in the church of all places, in the church we would feel safe all the time. Nothing bad would ever happen in the church. But sometimes it does. Jesus warns us to be careful to take care of one another, to be careful of one another because there are predators. There's a parable that Jesus told one time that I think explains why this kind of thing happens. Look at Matthew 13, Matthew 13, starting at verse 47. Matthew 13, verse 47. Jesus was telling stories about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he said, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible tells us that God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And God wants that so very dearly. He wants it so much that he casts his net, the gospel, the good news of salvation. He casts that far and wide as possible. He throws his net of salvation over the entire world. And in the process, in the image that Jesus used, some good fish and some bad fish are caught. In the church, there are good people and bad people. Um, in the church, there are people that, that do not belong, that never belonged. People that may look like sheep, but are really wolves. Even in the church, in the kingdom of God, we have to be careful. It's a terrible thing for us to have to admit. Again, we wish that in the church everything was perfect. We wish that in the church we never had to worry about anything. But the church is made up of people, and people are sinful. 
We have to be careful. Look at another passage, this time way in the back of your Bible, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. The apostle warns us to be careful. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. How do we know who's telling the truth and who isn't? I wish I could tell you there's an easy way to do it. But let's go back to 1 John 4, pick up at verse 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Again, I wish I could tell you that there was a verse in the Bible that was very clear. There was a place in the Bible that was like a magic bullet. And it told us exactly how to be careful. It told us exactly what to look for, what to watch out for, a way that made it easy for us to identify who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. But I don't think there's any verse like that in the Bible. Go back to Matthew again, Matthew chapter seven, another time, Matthew chapter seven, this time verse 22. Jesus tells us it's really hard for us to tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Matthew seven, verse 22. Jesus is talking about what it's gonna be like at the end of the world. And he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles. So people teach in the name of Jesus. They prophesy in the name of Jesus. They do miracles in the name of Jesus. They cast out demons in the name of Jesus. One would surely think that they were good guys, right? But Matthew tells us that Jesus will say to them on that day, I never knew you. It's really hard to tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are sometimes. So the bad news is that there are thieves and robbers out there, people who are ready and willing to take away from us whatever they want, who are ready to take away from us the good news of God's love for us in Jesus and the assurance of our salvation. But the good news is there's a shepherd. Actually, it's better than that. The good news is there's a good shepherd, the good shepherd, the son of God, the savior of the world, who warns us about all the dangers and more than that is always working to protect us and keep us safe. Jesus is our good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. We're gonna try something different right now. We're gonna pause for a moment and we're gonna give you an opportunity to do a little work at home, to look into the scriptures either by yourself or with somebody else that's at home with you, to look at some passages in the Bible that talk about how Jesus is our shepherd. I wanna emphasize, this is not a test. It's not homework. There's not gonna be any grading. And as always, some of the questions are gonna require us to put on our imagination caps. Online, you'll see a worksheet. Use it as, as you want in a way that is helpful to you. It's not homework, don't stress about it. But there's some passages there that speak about Jesus as a shepherd. Go ahead and take a moment to look those over to maybe even talk about them if there's somebody at home with you or on the phone with somebody or online. Spend a little time looking at the Bible and then we'll come back together to close things.
Okay, let's get back together. I wish we could share with one another the parts of Psalm 23 that each of us chose as our personal favorite. And maybe when we're all back together again, I hope it's not too long from now, hopefully not too long, when we get back together again, we can share those things with us. But let's close up today's lesson. I have no idea what goes through the mind of a sheep. But the images presented to us in the Bible strongly suggest that sheep don't really care as long as their shepherd is there. As long as they know their shepherd is taking care of them, then sheep are cool. A whole lot is going on in our world right now and in our minds, not the least of which is wondering when and how this whole coronavirus thing is all gonna end. There's a lot we don't know. Let me ask you a question. Can it be enough for us to know that the Good Shepherd is leading us and will bring us where he knows is best for us. Sheep don't appear to care as long as they know their shepherd is there leading them. Our shepherd is leading us. Today's section includes the promises that the Good Shepherd calls his sheep by name. Jesus knows your name and he knows my name and he calls us by name. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but I have seven grandchildren and every once in a while I mix up their names. I'll call one by another's name. Sometimes I even call them by their parents' name. It's easy for us to get names confused. The Good Shepherd knows your name. And I don't think he ever gets our names confused. He knows us personally. He knows us intimately. He knows our name. His voice is so familiar to us that when we hear it, we fall into line ready to follow him. He leads us out of the pen and goes ahead of us and we follow him because we know he knows where he's going. He leads us out of the pen. That's huge. That's really huge. It doesn't appear that God's will for us, that God's goal for us is for us to live risk-free lives cooped up in a pen someplace where there is no chance of adventure or danger. Green pastures do not exist in a pen nor still waters. Oh, there's a tank probably, but it's the same old water always. Not the beautiful water of a babbling brook. Green pastures and still waters are out there someplace. And the only way to enjoy them is to go out and follow Jesus. Jesus knows where the green pastures and the still waters are. And when we follow him, he brings us there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we want to know all the answers. We want to figure everything out. We want to be able to plan every last detail of our lives. We want to be in control. And right now, we're having a hard time doing that. Remind us, remind us that our shepherd is in control. Remind us that our shepherd knows. Remind us to keep our eyes always on Jesus, on our Good Shepherd, and to follow him wherever he leads. 
because you have promised us that you want only what is good for us and not evil to give us a future and a hope. We praise you, Father, for the assurance that you are with us always. We can't always be together right now. We have to be apart from each other, but we are not apart from you. Watch over your church. Watch over your creation. And as we go about our individual lives, help us to listen to your voice, to hear your word, to follow you, and to love you. We ask it in Jesus, the Savior's name. Amen. See you next time.